it's such a relief to be able to tell you that finally my, um, my book, Scripture and the Skeptic, is available everywhere that uh, you find books. Um, uh, it's also available like in our lobby here at River Oaks today and at Timber Grove. This is the last Sunday we'll have these books available on site in person on Sundays. You can find it online, uh, Amazon, etc., wherever books are sold. Uh, Amazon gives me like eight and a half cents per copy. For, uh, for <laughs> Anyway, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, writing books is fun. And it's for the impact. It's not for the money. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay, that's what I'm feeling right now. So that's great. All right. So Scripture and the Skeptic is a book for skeptics about the Bible. And I know from experience how easy it is to discount the Bible when you are a suspicious or skeptical person. When you've gone to school, you're intellectual, you consider yourself kind of smart or whatever, like it's super easy to look down on the Bible. And so that's what I wrote the book about. I never, ever would have imagined that I would be someone who writes a book in defense of the Bible's perfection, but that's where I'm at now. And so I wanted to call this book the perfect book. And the publisher was like, that's a little arrogant, don't you think? I'm like, I'm talking about the Bible, not my book. Anyway, they, they made me change the title. And, and so I, I do believe at this point in my life that the Bible is a perfect story, the perfect book about the perfect God. And I, I want to I explain why I do that in the book. And uh, I'll also be doing that in our new sermon series that starts today um, by the same title. Uh, for eight weeks, I'll be taking us through the eight questions posed in these eight chapters in the book. You don't have to read the book to resonate with the messages. I'm writing them separately. It's not like I'm just reciting word for word what's in the book. And if you are reading the book, don't worry. You're not just going to get repeated material, okay? Um, might be a little bit here and there, but not much at all. Now, I really wanted to preach messages that dig a little deeper, all right? All of our groups are going to be discussing this book for the next eight weeks. If you don't have a group, let us get you connected. All right, so just go to the story.church slash groups. We'd love to get you connected with, uh, with some new friends to walk through this book together. That's really where the magic happens, I think, is in the small group setting. So we'd love to get you uh, plugged in in that way. All right, so uh, why don't we dig in today? The, the first chapter of the book really centers around this question about the humanity of the Bible. Um, isn't the Bible only human? So why start the book with this this question, of all questions you could ask about the Bible, why this one? Well, it's because since we started the story almost six years ago, I've been paying close attention to the questions skeptics ask about the Bible. And skeptics always have lots of questions about the Bible, but one of the most common ones, one of the most frequently asked questions, and I would say one of the most common justifications people give for walking away from the Bible and never looking back, has to do with the human element why should I or anyone really care what the Bible says or how the Bible tells me to live my life today if it was just written by a bunch of men? And not even like modern men. It was written by a bunch of men in the dark ages, they say. That's the thing, right? So it was written by a bunch of men a long time ago who knew nothing of science or cosmology like we do today. They, they lacked a lot of the understanding we have today. We could inform them about a lot of things instead of the other way around. Why should I surrender my life to the Bible if that is the case? And what's really amazing, I think, or maybe amazing is a strong word, really surprising for non-believers uh, oftentimes, and for some Christians too, is that these kinds of questions aren't just being asked outside of the church. I hear these questions all the time from people inside the church. Lifelong self-avowed Christians will often say things like, hey, I like the Bible, but let's not get carried away here. Let's not get carried away and say the whole thing is true or perfect or whatever. Like, it's nice. It's got a good message, but let's just be reasonable here. And one of the, one of the more polished ways that I'll hear this kind of, this, this halfway justification with the Bible is when I hear a Christian say something like, well, I'm not really here to follow a book. I'm here to follow Jesus, right? I hear that a lot. And I know it's well-intentioned. I know what we're trying to do. When we say, well, G Jesus is the real word of God, not really the Bible. Jesus is the true word of God, not just the Bible. When we say things like that, we inadvertently undermine the scriptures. I think it's in an effort to make Christianity more palatable to modern day people. Obviously, that's what we're trying to do. I don't want to disparage that intention at all. I just want to point out an obvious flaw, I guess, in the logic 
of that whole line of thinking. And, and whenever somebody says, Jesus is the word of God, not the Bible, I want to engage them <laughs> in conversation. I want to be like, okay, so where'd you get that idea? That Jesus is the word of God and not the Bible. And they'll be like, well, pastor, you should know. John chapter one, in the beginning was the word. And the word became flesh. That's Jesus. And then I want to say, well, what? Where does, that, where does it say that? And where does John 1 come from? Well, it comes from the Gospel of John, Pastor, you should know. Where does the Gospel of John come from? The New Testament? I don't know, Pastor, you tell me. Where does the New Testament come from? Okay, the Bible. Here we are. Okay, we're in the Bible. And, and the only reason to follow that line of thinking is to point out the flaw in that logic, right? So what you're saying is the Bible can't be trusted because it was written by men. So on what grounds do you trust the men who wrote about Jesus? Everything we know about Jesus, almost everything we know about Jesus comes from the men who wrote the Bible. And so it's not so simple as to say, well, men wrote the Bible, so we can kind of take some and leave some. Men wrote the Bible, but some men really knew and some men didn't. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. And, and I think sometimes we just need to kind of get over ourselves and let ourselves surrender to Scripture. And that was a real struggle of mine for, gosh, 33 years, really. Really, I mean, more accurately from like 19 and 20 years old until 33. That's when I really struggled mightily with this idea. Now, I still went to church. In some cases, I led churches but I wasn't a Christian. Jesus wasn't my God. Until eight years ago this month, by the way, eight years ago this month, Jesus became my God. Before that, y'all, I was my own God. I kept Jesus around, but he wasn't God to me. He was more like that, a useful acquaintance. He was like that guy, you know, you call him a friend, but he's not really a friend. He just, he has a truck. <laughs> and so he's, he's useful. You'll call him when you need him. You know what I mean? Everybody needs somebody like that in their orbit. They can call on when they need a truck, when it's time to move, right? That's who Jesus was to me. I called him when I needed him. But when everything changed for me was eight years ago when Jesus became my God. And what I realized at that point is that I couldn't keep treating the Bible the way that I treated the Bible, explaining it away, acting like, take it or leave it, take some parts, leave some others. Jesus never really gives us that option. The Bible itself doesn't really give us that choice. And so we have to decide what to do with the Bible. And when I finally got my own feelings, my own emotions, my own politics and opinions out of the way, and I took an objective look at scripture, what I found really surprised me. I found a couple of things. First of all, I found um, a lack of excuses when it comes to scripture. There, there was, I couldn't find one verse where in the Bible it says, some of this is true, some of it isn't. And the second thing that I found was this sort of self-attestation from within the witness of scripture. I found the Bible self-identifying as the true and good and perfect word of God. And so, yes, the Bible calls Jesus the word of God, but more often, cover to cover, the Bible refers to itself as the true and timeless word of God. Now, you can say, well, that sounds like circular logic. Pastor, you're telling me the Bible is true because the Bible says it's true. That doesn't hold water. But it's not quite like that. I mean, what we have in the Bible are multiple witnesses each attesting to different parts of Scripture as timeless and true. Let me show you a little example of what I mean. So in the Old Testament, for example, hundreds of years before Jesus walked the earth, we have examples of Old Testament authors referring to the Bible, in particular to the Old Testament, as the Word of God. So Psalm, Psalms, right? So throughout the Psalms, you see examples of this. In Psalm 119, 105, it says, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Now you could say in an ethereal foreshadowing kind of way, the psalmist is writing about Jesus, but more directly, the psalmist is writing about the books of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Old Testament, calling those books the word of God that lights your path. Um, the prophet Isaiah said something very similar 
He said in chapter 40, verse eight, the grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of God endures forever. And these are just two examples of dozens of others where the Old Testament self attests or self-identifies as the word of God. Now, Jesus grew up reading the Old Testament that we have today. It was what he called the Bible. (laughs) It wasn't a New Testament yet. Jesus grew up studying the same Old Testament you have in your Bibles. That's how he learned to read, was with the scriptures. There was no disputing which books belonged in the Old Testament, really. It was already a fixed canon by the time Jesus walked the earth. And so what did Jesus say about the Old Testament? Did he say, well, it used to be good, but now I'm here. Did he say, well, it used to make sense, but now here's what I really meant. No, Jesus gives no sort of outlet here or out clause when it comes to the Old Testament. He doesn't say that it was good, but now it isn't. He says very clearly in Matthew chapter five, he says, do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. That's the Old Testament. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Listen, if Jesus wanted us to have an out clause, he would have said, now this part you can edit, delete, do away with, ignore, whatever. He said, there's nothing to ignore, delete, or edit. I've come to fulfill what is here. Jesus was the embodiment of that fulfillment, okay? So um, when we look even further into the New Testament, we see other examples of the same trend. So Paul, everybody loves Paul, right? No, not not everybody. Uh, I hear people all the time say, well, I I really like Jesus. Paul, I could do without. (laughs) Paul's intense. And some people have heard in college or in other classes or online that Paul was kind of a a bigot, maybe, or a misogynist, anti-woman, or or homophobic, or something like that. If that's where you're at with Paul, I would just encourage you to, to read Paul for yourself, because I promise you he's not who you've heard that he is. And Paul said maybe the most, I think, oft-repeated phrase in the Bible about the Bible when he said to his friend Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all Scripture is God-breathed. All Scripture. And what's Scripture for Paul? Well, Scripture for Paul was the Old Testament. All of it, God-breathed, inspired by the Spirit of God, and it's good for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training. Now, if you're really a cynic about Scripture, your next question would be, who cares what Paul says? I don't even like that guy. Well, except for the fact that the first Christians, in fact, Jesus' chief disciple, Simon Peter, defended Paul and called Paul's writings Scripture too, on par with the Old Testament. And this, again, is another self-attestation from within the Bible. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 and 16. If you ever want to find really important passages in the Bible, by the way, search for 3.16. Have you noticed a trend? John 3.16, 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Peter 3.16. Here we go. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote to you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all of his letters, speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort. So they were doing what they're doing to Paul now hundreds of years ago. As they do, he says, the other scriptures. And there's the key. Let's leave this slide up for a second. The other scriptures. Other is a tiny word here, but it's huge. Because if Peter wanted us to think of Paul's letters as something less than scripture, he just would have said, as they do the scriptures. But Peter said, as they do the other scriptures, clearly implying that Paul's letters in the New Testament were interpreted as authoritative as the Old Testament, as he was writing them. So Paul wrote half the New Testament in terms of the number of books, 13 letters in the New Testament. And we have clear uh, examples of Paul's writings being referred to as scripture. So I could go on and on with this. The point here is that the Bible doesn't really give us the option to pick and choose. The Bible self-identifies and self-defines. You don't have to believe it, but don't make up your own definition. Don't make up your own explanation. It's, it's just plain and abundantly clear. You know the saying that when somebody shows you who they are, believe them? Well, the same is true about the Bible. When the Bible shows you again and again and again what it claims to be, either believe them or don't. But don't, let's, as Christians trying to make the, the word of God more palatable to the world, let's not change the definition or make up 
our own. We don't really get that luxury. It's kind of, more of, an all or nothing proposition. Right? Now, a lot of the things we say about the Bible to kowtow to culture or to, to try and make it more palatable, things like, um, you know, uh, some of it's good, some of it we can forget about, things like, well, yeah, there's just, there's some evil in the Bible. There's, some things were lost in translation. Some books that were supposed to be aren't in there. Some, you know, we kind of just wishy-wash about the Bible. A lot of the things we, I hear people saying about the Bible are things you say when you want to like Jesus, but you're not ready to love him. When, it's, it's not hard to find people who like Jesus. Jesus is very likable. Like, he's the only person in American history more likable than Jesus was Abraham Lincoln. I saw this in a study once. I still don't quite get it, but Jesus was second. That's pretty good. So Jesus, very likable figure. Everybody likes him because he's a good guy and he looks out for the underdog and takes care of the poor and he hangs out with you know, all kinds of people. And, and so it's hard not to like him. But when you love him, the, the game changes. When you love him, you submit yourself to him. And I'm speaking from experience. This struggle is so real for so many of us because we're proud people. And we, we don't really like to surrender to anything. We, we want to like Jesus, but we also want to keep doing the things we're doing. And for a long time, I liked Jesus, but I also found myself explaining away the Bible. Jesus is cool, guys. The whole Bible isn't, but Jesus is cool. I know the Bible says that about sin, but that's not really who God is. Like, you do you. God made you the way that you are and loves you the way that you are. I'm okay, you're okay. Let's do life together and be happy. God wants you to be, those are the kinds of things that I used to say. I know the Bible says that about hell, but it's just a metaphor. Hell is just something religious people made up to scare you. I used to say that. Or the Bible doesn't really say that about sex. Like God made you to enjoy sex, so just enjoy it. However you enjoy it, it's all good. You're good, it's fine. Those are the kinds of things we say whenever we like Jesus without loving him. And I couldn't continue saying those things after I learned to fall in love with Jesus. I found myself ashamed of the ways that I had spent my time on earth beating the Bible into submission to my will instead of fully submitting myself to him. So now when I open the Bible, I see a whole different book than I did back in those days. Because now when I open the Bible, I see that it is Jesus on every page. I see that the Old Testament points ahead to him. The New Testament either points directly at him or points back toward him. The whole thing is either anticipating Jesus or reacting to him. And I see that he is the thread that holds all of it together. And if I love him, I can't deny his word anymore. I have to surrender myself to him if my love for him is real, even though submission was a hard thing for me. And I know that's a difficult concept for many of you who struggle with scripture because you've been hurt by people using the Bible. But when we look at the Bible, I want you to see that the only reason surrendering to it, submitting to it, or recognizing the perfection of it is Jesus. It's not about religion or control or manipulation. Jesus is the thread that holds it all together. And when you fall in love with him, you fall in love with it. So the question that I posed in the first chapter really was about the identity of Jesus. Who is he? When we look at Jesus, we're talking about a human being. We talk about Jesus being truly human and truly divine, right? That was one of the first creedal phrases or beliefs about Jesus is that he's truly human and truly divine. I think it's easier to think about him as divine than it is human. I think it's just hard for us to wrap our heads around. And I think that's borne out in the art that we've created about Jesus over the years. Find me a work of art that's famous in the Louvre or something that reflects his humanity. You, it's, it's hard to do. So all kinds of pieces with him in, in halos and glowing and, you know, this blue eyes. And we have movies of Jesus speaking in British accents like he's posh. Like, and he says things like blessed instead of blessed. Who says blessed? No one. But Jesus, Jesus was a human being. 
He hanged out with his friends. He worked in a construction job. He took care of his mother. He drank a little. He ate a lot. And, and he hung out with all kinds of sordid people. And so I'm just waiting for those works of art to appear in the Louvre and in museums like the Louvre. Like, like I want to see that portrait of Jesus popping a zit in his bathroom mirror. I want to see Jesus like looking for the other sock, <laughs> you know, like the rest of us, because he did those things. He got hungry. He got thirsty. He got tired. He got angry. He felt pain. He, he took naps in boats. <laughs> like he did all kinds of things that human people do because he himself is human. And if the person we're talking about, who is the thread that holds the Bible together, is not just coming to us to show us the face of God, but to show us the true face of humanity as well, I think that changes how we look at Scripture, all right? So um, for me, I don't know how much this will resonate with all of you, but I think for me and hardcore skeptics, understanding the implications of of a human Bible was a shift. Because what I realized is that when we have at the center of the Bible this this human, this this perfect man, Jesus, when we have all of these other attestations in the Bible, all these other witnesses to Jesus pointing toward him, what we have in, in total is something that's entirely unlike other religious books. So I don't know if you've ever struggled with the Bible because it sounds magic. It sounds like mythical. I don't know if you've struggled with it because it sounds like other holy texts. That was a hang-up for me until I discovered the humanity of the Bible. And what I mean with that is that you have all of these multiple human witnesses attesting to this one person, whereas in other holy books, what you have is some sage, some guru, some leader with some enthusiasm and, and some charisma going off to some cave up some mountain, out in some field, and having a personal encounter with some angel who gives them some secret knowledge and some secret language, and they come back and go, just trust me, guys. And I can't give my life to something like that. I'm too, I'm too skeptical. I can't give my life to that kind of mythology. But what we have in the Bible is truly different. We don't have just one witness of one sage, one guru going off and coming back with some truth. We have to accept or die. What we have with the Bible is 66 different books written in nine different literary genres across three different continents in three different languages across 1,500 years time. And we have 40 plus different authors all in their own times and places and languages, attesting to the same man, attesting to the same God who came to us in Jesus. This is truly different. And some of what I'm describing to you is sort of the reason why the Bible can be confusing. I know it's confusing to read something that's supposed to be God's truth, and you've got the same event being described by two different authors in different ways. Which one is true? It induces anxiety in us. But listen, that's part of what God is doing with the Bible is showing us this human side, this human element. People see and experience the same event in different ways, of course. (laughs) Think about the alternative. I've talked about this before, but you had four different witnesses to the resurrection and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all kind of saw it a little bit differently. Like one of them saw an angel, the others didn't. And one of them saw two women, the others seemed to see more or less or whatever. Which one is true? The truth of the matter is found in the empty tomb, a fact to which all four of them attest. And if all four of these witnesses reported the same event verbatim in lockstep with no deviation, that's something that's clearly contrived. Obviously, they got together and got their story straight. What we have in the Bible are 40 plus authors who didn't get together to get their story straight. They just told you about what God was doing in the world and what God had come to do in Jesus. That's truly a different story. That's a different book. That's a different kind of witness than what you might come to expect from holy books. The whole thing, all of them, Genesis to Revelation, revolving around Jesus. 
So when you open your Bible, when I talk about seeing Jesus on every page, this is what I mean. Go all the way back to the beginning. One of the oldest stories in the Bible, Cain and Abel. Remember what happens? It's not a pretty story. The world's first murder, sibling rivalry. Cain says, Abel, let's go for a walk. And he comes back home from the walk without his little brother. Cain took him out. The question is, what did God do in response? Well, God came to meet Cain and God said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? And Cain said, what? Am I my brother's keeper? And that question sets the table for the whole Bible. And if you pay attention to the whole narrative, what you see is that question popping up between brothers and sisters again and again and again. Jacob and Esau. Jacob stole his brother's birthright, essentially saying, am I my brother's keeper? It's not my problem. I'm good. And then he paid the price for it. We have other stories of Joseph and his brothers who sold him out, sold him as a slave, 20 pieces of silver. Now, are we our brother's keeper? Not our problem. You've got other stories about brothers and sisters, Mary and Martha. Mary, who wouldn't get up and help Martha with dinner, and Martha just complains to Jesus, Lord, am I my sister's keeper? And Jesus comes and answers that question once and for all. Not with judgment, not with hellfire and brimstone. He comes and answers that question with a story about a father who had two sons, both of whom hated each other, both of whom resented their father for different reasons. And they failed to keep each other. And failed to love each other. But even in their failure, even in their fallen humanity, the Father's love was enough to bring them together. Jesus came to answer the cry of our hearts once and for all. Yes, you're made to love. Yes, you're made to keep your brother. Yes, you're made to care for your sister. But even when you fall short, the love of the Father is enough. This is truly different, unique, and inspired. And this is powerful enough to change your life. And that's the best thing about what's happened in my life since I've fallen in love with, with the Bible. I, I've been able to lead others to do the same thing. And I've seen so many people whose lives have been changed by, by understanding the Bible the way that it was meant to be understood. And I think back even to Kansas City before I moved to Houston with my family. I had a year and a half in Kansas City still to sort of make right what I'd gotten wrong all those years up there. After I came to know Jesus, I had a year and a half to lead people to love God and Jesus and the Bible. And I think about this one person, her, her name was Christina. Christina was in her 30s and she was a sweet, soft-spoken suburban mom. And she came alongside of us in our ministry before I had really surrendered to Jesus. And we were a church full of hippies. And she would, we would just wanted to make the world a better place and sing Kumbaya and all that stuff. And that's what we were about before I had that experience in Capernaum. But she stuck with me after that as well. And when I came back and I was just on fire for Jesus and his work, she followed me there as well. And I remember after preaching a sermon about the prodigal son and the father who loved him, Christina said, it's time for me to take this more seriously. And so she left behind her energies and her chakras and her vibrations and all the stuff she used to talk about. And we used to talk about at that church before my conversion. And she said, I got to take seriously what you're saying. And so she started to volunteer in the church office. One day she was in the office by herself. And you should know that Christina is as sweet and, and just soft-spoken as you can imagine. Five, five, maybe 120, soaking wet. Like just not a very imposing figure. One day she was there by herself and two women showed up at the door. Our church was in a very challenged part of town. And Christina later told me that these women were very imposing figures. They were very large people. And she wasn't disparaging them or anything. She, she would never disparage anyone. That's just who she was. But she said they came into the office and they sat down in front of her desk and they said, we're here for sack lunches and bus passes. We always kept sack lunches and bus passes because of the area we were in. People were in need. And so we need some sack lunches and bus passes. And she said, okay, I'm going to go back and get some. You just hang tight. She went back around the corner to grab them. When she came back to the office, she saw them going through her purse. And she said in a moment, she didn't even know how to react, but she just said, excuse me, what are you doing? And they looked at her and they looked at each other and they just bolted. And they hit the hallway. They ran down the corridor toward the, the exterior entrance so they could get out. And Christina, instead of stopping to call the cops like I might have, instead of just locking the office door and making sure she's safe, Christina went running after them. Five foot, five inch, 120 pound, soft-spoken suburban mother of three, Christina went running after them saying, wait, stop. Stop where you are. Don't move. 
And she chased them down the hallway, but they were faster and they got to the end of the hallway and ran right into the door because they thought it would open when they pushed it, but the deadbolt had locked behind them. And so they just banged right into the door. Realizing they were trapped, they looked back at Christina who was running toward them with this crazed look in her eyes. And when she got toward them, like within arm's reach, she reached out her arms, both arms toward them. And in both hands, she had the sack lunches and bus passes that they came for. She said, I don't want you to forget these. And then she unlocked the door, opened it and said, you know where to find us. Come back anytime. And when Christina told me that story and I watched the footage of the security tapes, (laughs) I just thought, Christina, what are you doing? You put yourself in danger. Next time, just stay back, call the cops. She said, no, Eric, I just heard you talk about the father and how he went chasing after his son. And I couldn't not do for them what he's done for me. This love, this God, this Jesus who came to chase us, to claim us and embrace us, even though we've stolen from him, taken him for granted, even though we've denied him, this Jesus changes people's hearts like no one else can. He can change your heart as well. And that's why I wrote this book, because we fall in love with Jesus more the more we fall in love with the Bible. I want you to know just how loved you are, even even when your frail, fallen humanity leads you to fall short and fail, even when you fall into the same trap again and again. The Father's love is enough. It's enough for those women and Christina. It was enough for the prodigal son. It's enough for you and me. You can trust the word of God. You can trust the Bible and stake your life on it. Try to stand on anything else and it's like shifting sand, but stand on the foundation of God's eternal word and there will be security, peace, certainty, and joy like you've never experienced before. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray right now for the skeptic, for the cynic in the room and online at Timber Grove as well. And those of us who are just stubborn and hard-hearted and unwilling to surrender to religion, organized religion, preachers, professional gurus and the like, Lord, help us to see right now that's not what any of this is about. This is about truth. This is about what's real. This is about our God who made us. This is about Jesus who saved us. This is about the one foundation that won't let us down. And so, Lord, I pray for us to have the courage to step out onto that foundation right now. Even if the Bible is really intimidating, it seems like it's too big to even approach it. But I pray for faith to take baby steps toward it. We pray right now in Jesus' name, giving you thanks with all of our hearts. Amen.